I'll kick off with uh, with uh, uh, basically a comment. I think mostly on, uh, to, to Carol. Uh, you mentioned that something you had found uh, was that the links between the FDI uh, 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 companies, the, the larger, larger uh, export-oriented companies uh, to the local economy uh, were uh, relatively uh, limited in Africa as opposed to elsewhere. And uh, that, that, that's, that's probably true. Uh, and uh, and uh, well, what, what we have seen in our investment is that that when when you go to places where you, where you have lots of sort of smaller companies in the same area or or, or, or bigger clusters etc., the chances of you uh, sort of bringing more and more the various uh, the production of various inputs into into that that location um, are, are are better. But uh, um, uh, as the DFI concerned with the, with the, uh, uh, creating jobs. Uh, our approach, uh, our uh, lear learning has been that, that actually in most cases the big, big chunk of the jobs is not in the companies that we finance, it's in the upstream, downstream, it's, it's somewhere, it's, it's, it's in, the, in, in the connections. And, and we see really, really, really large connections, uh, maybe not in manufacturing, but let's say, uh, let's say mobile telecommunication, which uh, in the beginning of, of, of uh, this century, just after the, 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 the turn of the uh, millennium, uh, was very much DFI thing. Uh, the private sector hadn't entered that 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 uh, game yet, uh, and the development finance institution were doing it at the time when Mo Ibrahim sold his uh, Celtel uh, company operating in a number of countries in Africa. He said that he had, uh, I think he said he had one million points of sale. Uh, uh, small companies selling those scratch cards and and selling their time, etc which was the start of a huge number of businesses, some of which actually are our clients now in, very, uh, in, in, in a number of, of, of sectors. So, so there, was a, there was a sort of a, a big impact on, on, on SMEs from that. Uh, likewise, when we invest in, uh, in, uh, in power sector, uh, we think that, that the employment impact is, is huge, not in that, that uh, uh, windmill park, Providing lots of employment, but in 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 the use of, of, of power, people having having access to power. Likewise, if if you look at uh, let's say forestry plantations in 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 southern highlands of Tanzania, there are these thousands and thousands of smallholders all around them planting trees since they think that the market is going to be there for their product. Uh, so 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 we we see lots and lots of sort of connections between large and small companies, even in Africa. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's precisely where the, some of the opportunities are for employment generation from large scale FDI investments. In our study, we don't we don't we don't find those linkages for manufacturing. We just don't. But it, obviously, in other sectors, you're gonna you're gonna see it. I mean, I mean, if I look take the Irish example, I mean, this is where most of our employment growth in our SME sector came from was from large FDI firms like Intel, like Dell, coming into Ireland back in the 1990s. And then it was through all of the supply chain linkages that we had this massive growth of employment in, in, domestic, in the domestic sector. So it's those kinds of linkages that I think the real, where the real opportunities are. I mean, it's obviously the case that it's there in other sectors, but in manufacturing, you just don't see it, which is surprising. You know? mm -hmm. okay. no. We have lots of hands up. So. Thank you. Um, Roger Williamson, Institute for Development Studies. A question uh, to Andy and Carol uh, particularly, but others are uh, welcome to comment. Um, implicit in what you've said, there's probably quite a story about jobs in uh, rural areas and urban areas. Uh, what do you think that story is? So, uh, my name is Ricardo Santos from UNU Wider in Mozambique. And, uh, Thank you so much for the presentations, first of all. And um, my question is, the first one is, is a little bit of a provocation to Andy and to see if, if it would be possible to add in your reflection two other crises that have been, that are topics of, of this conference. So one is how does it relate with the migration refugee crisis, considering that Africa seems to have a little bit of a demographic, labor market's own dynamics in the world that suggests that migration from Africa is 
and evidence. Um, and the other is how does that uh, relate also with um, something we talked about in the trade uh, session was global value chains and this trend of, of making manufacturing more and more uh, automated, so therefore uh, labor saving. And if I could um, then ask Carol to give us a hand on Mozambique and so it seems that Mozambique has a very shallow formal economy which gives uh, which suggests that uh, FDI in Mozambique has a potential of making a, a shock of, of introducing the introduction of a new formal industry in Mozambique might switch the structure of the market in a way that complements what, what uh, Sam was suggesting, which is it's kind of, it's not, the current structure is not enough. It needs to, to be changed in a way. But uh, which FDI would work there? Hello, my name is Lea Nakadama from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, I have also a question to Andy. Um, thank you very much for the very informative um, presentation. I was wondering if you've considered gender gap as part of your analysis. Um, uh, you talk about agriculture, informal sector, investment sectors where investments have been made. Um, they are very... Um, the gender dynamics are there um, and, and such. And, and then again, education's relationship with fertility and, and such things. So I, I was kind of missing that link um, in all of this. So when we talk about people who need jobs, who are these people? And do we need to consider also some sort of a discrimination that we need to address as part of the solution? Thank you. And if you start? Yeah, um, that's an interesting set of questions. I think some of this comes down to is um, who's going to create all these jobs? I think that's an issue. I mean, it, we sort of, at the moment, there seem to be three sources. There's obviously there's a foreign investment, uh, and that obviously I would include in that the spillovers into local firms that feed or, or are supported or thrive through foreign investment. Then there's, uh, and so that creates a lot of, particularly a lot of jobs for uh, parts of the labour force that have slightly more skills, a bit more education. Um, and they're probably higher, the productivity, higher productivity jobs. Then you've got SMEs, which of course, uh, I mean, as Carol pointed out, they, they employ a lot of people, but probably the net gain is, is not uh, significant, and they're very low productivity, but these, these are the way most people stay alive. Um, and then there's also state-owned enterprises, which we haven't really talked about uh, very much. Um, and perhaps there's a discussion to be had there. I mean, there's, there's a, a silent, uh, I'm not sure silence is the right word, there's a kind of resurgence of developmentalism, uh, particularly if you look across some of the middle income countries like Indonesia, where the state, state owned enterprises survived the privatization process and are now largely minority owned state owned enterprises, where governments use a variety of mechanisms, formal and informal, and whether those achieve the developmental objectives that they hope, I think is an open question at the moment. But there's an, I think there's an issue about <clears throat> if you wanted large scale uh, employment, the kind we're talking about, for uh, for say, rural people or, or for um, those with, with low levels of uh, uh, education uh, or low levels of formal education, uh, it's, um, it, it seems to me that SMEs are limited in what they'll ever deliver apart from just about staying alive. Uh, foreign investment is, is, is very good for the, the economy and national development overall. Uh, also, certainly, you know, if, if, if the government is able to put in place a framework that manages foreign investment. I mean, I mean interesting, a lot of people talk about the relationship between aid and growth in the econometrics. I don't think maybe people realise that the, the FDI and growth relationship is also incredibly difficult to find in the econometrics. So it really suggests there's a huge heterogeneity in how, how governments manage foreign investment uh, and whether they're able to put, to put in place uh, some of these things. Um, I think there's also an issue, I mean, one of the issues around um, deindustrialization or reindustrialization, or whatever you, however you, you frame it. Um, I mean, Roderick talks a lot about his, his thesis is that trade liberalization has created a situation where protected industries suddenly can't compete. Uh, he also did mention China. I mean, I think you, you can't ignore the fact that most countries, if they're moving up the, the value-added chain, are, are going to be competing with China and bits of East Asia, and that's, that's not an easy thing to do. Um, so in terms of the, uh, the, the kind of rural-urban story, taking each of the questions in turn, 
I think there's, there's, I mean, East Asia was very successful in promoting rural manufacturing, where, you know, the assumption would be that manufacturing is very much an urban affair. But again, it, it takes a developmentalist state to, to put these things together. And, the, 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 and of course, there's limits to that. And there's, you think about the financing and so forth. Um, I think there's also an issue about, I mean, obviously, there's the, this, uh, the, the numbers that on, on uh, responding to Ricardo, um, the numbers on refugees and migration are, of course, are going to be a big deal over the next 70 to 100 years, I would expect. Uh, I mean, if, the, if you believe the projections and the medium variant projections, you're talking about an extra billion jobs in sub-Saharan Africa every decade. Uh, so that's a huge number of jobs. And if they're high productivity jobs, there's not going to be, there's not necessarily going to be a large number of them. So I think, again, it sort of comes back to who's going to create these jobs and, um, you know, how's that going to be done and what role, the, what role is the state going to take in managing, uh, either managing foreign investment, which is, you know, is, 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 is easier for, you know, China can manage foreign investment, but it's much harder for countries with less technical expertise and, and less clout when it comes to negotiating with large companies. And then underlying this is always a sort of question of mark about technology and automation that comes back to the, the deindustrialization thesis, which is basically arguing, you know, over the next uh, 50 or so years, uh, I mean, even if you live in an OECD country, I'd worry about what, what jobs my children will get, let alone, you know, children in, in Mozambique. Um, and so the opportunities that perhaps uh, uh, came up for East Asia aren't necessarily opportunities that will be there in, in, uh, in over the next 30 to 50 years, because a lot of the things that that being done, yes, you know, simple things that, that uh, once 3D printing becomes on industrial scale, it's going to change a lot of these kind of these opportunities for, for national economic development. But in, in all this doom and gloom, I don't actually have any answers. But I, th I think there's some there's some interesting avenues to go down in terms of uh, uh, some of the conceptual ideas around inclusive structural change, but also some of the field work and looking more closely at countries and how. You know how how was it East Asia did provide at least for a, a period of time a substantial number of a substantial proportion or a substantial increase in job creation over time, um, and on the gender dynamics, I I I can see uh, I could I could speculate about them, but I I don't know, so I probably shouldn't speculate. I mean, do you want to add to this, this or? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I don't think I have answers to these questions, but I guess I can comment um, a little bit. So first on the, on the rural um, urban issue, it's, it's clear that the types of policies that you would try to put in place to promote job creation in urban areas are going to be different to those in rural areas. I mean, you're seeing a lot of rural urban migration, so a lot of, a lot of people are coming to the cities to find jobs. Um, but I think the same principles will probably apply in terms of um, developing and promoting agribusiness um, in linking in smallholders with larger, um, larger scale operators. Um, there's also potential in terms of agritourism, those kinds of things. So I think that there is, it's just a matter of, you know, as what Andy says, it's just a matter of having a state that is about mental state that, that um, is thinking about the rural areas in the same way as we're thinking about the urban areas. So yeah, no, there, there, I think that there are a different, a different set of policies that, that would be put in place. Um, on the Mozambique case, um, I mean, I don't know what sector <laughs> you should attract FDI into in Mozambique. Um, but what I would say is that, I mean, what makes more sense is to, to think about um, the supply chain and think about where the, you know, whether, where, the, where, where the linkages could potentially be. Um, that's not an easy thing to do. You can't really know. And sometimes it is just a shock that happens and, and, then, and then just things happen organically after that. But I mean, I'd be interested to, to, to read more about it and to think more about that one. Um, but I, I mean, the principle is there that, I mean, you track the foreign firms. If you have kind of the underlying capabilities there for firms to benefit from the, the linkages with those FDI firms, then you do see, in other cases, you do see these productivity spillovers um, 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 emerging. Um, the other, only other comment on, on, on the gender gap, and I think, I mean, it's not something that featured in, in our research, so I can't, I can't comment specifically on it, but I, but I do think that it's something we have to pay attention to is where the job opportunities are. I mean, the, there is a gender dimension there. We know from other studies that it's, you know, women, um, the, the jobs created for women are different than the jobs created for men in many of these cases. So certainly I would say more research is needed there to, to push that agenda. Not that anyone asked me a question, but uh, 
<laughs> no, I'm joking. Don't let, I, that don't, don't let that stop me. No, exactly, quite. Uh, I, I th just to pick up on two things, I think the, the issue of technological changes is, I think, very, very relevant uh, for, for many uh, countries, and in particular, low-income countries. The, the, the graphic I showed about uh, the projected number of individuals in Mozambique, workers without a full primary education, uh, is very interesting when we think about that technology is typically replacing people at the lower end of the skill spectrum uh, in many cases, right? So that's going to be incredibly more challenging. And just to give one anecdotal example, uh, a lot of the discussion around industrialization in Mozambique and actually many other uh, sub-Saharan African countries is agro-industry. We've got you know, huge amounts of agricultural production. Why don't we put the value added through agro-industry? Uh, a lot of uh, technological changes are happening in agro-industry. So cashew nut production now, uh, there's new technologies which are coming in which can uh, de-shell the cashew nuts uh, very cheaply, much more efficiently than having a, a room full of 500 women de-shelling them. And that is extremely challenging. So, uh, uh, and there's firms in Mozambique now who are trying to, who are setting up high productivity cashew uh, nut de-shelling operations and can't find the workers because they need higher skill workers and they don't work in those regions. They're, they're not available in those regions. So there are these kinds of shifts happening which are making the, the planning, uh, the man force plan, the manpower planning even more uh, 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 acute and difficult. And it's very difficult uh, for, uh, for anyone really to know what's really gonna happen. Predictions are uh, always wrong essentially when it comes to these kind of very long-term changes. Um, the only other point I think I'd like to mention is that we often think about industrialization uh, in a very country specific way, but it's very clear that the real patterns and drivers underlying you know, successful cases of industrialization have to take into account the global environment. What's happening with the, op you know, what is the opportunity cost of uh, cheap labor? Uh, where, are the, where are the opportunities for, for labor intensive manufacturing? Where, where are the, what are the global trends in, these value, in the value chains? Uh, again, very difficult to predict, but that's where we need to think about well, how can some of these uh, sub-Saharan African countries uh, take advantage of opportunities that open up in terms of these broader global patterns. Um, makes it much more difficult to, to figure out, but it, I think we have to move out of the kind of national uh, silo of thinking, of thinking it's only about our, our local policies. Uh, we have to think of that in, in a wider context, and that's why regional trade policy is so important. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so um, let me just throw in a few thoughts um, which um, respond to the, the questions that we made before we take, take the next round. Um, on, on the rural-urban issue, but also the, the sort of formal versus informal employment um, uh, composition of, <coughs> of uh, jobs, um, development economics traditionally, you know, had this view that this goes back to classical development economics, that eventually the process of development is defined by a movement of people from agriculture into something like manufacturing or from informal into formal employment, you know, the classic Lewis-type uh, mechanisms. What we actually see in, in Sam's graph, um, the projections for Mozambique quite ably showed that, <coughs> is the informal sector is actually probably still going up in many of these economies. Um, now, as, as economists, we, we can sort of continue to talk about employment almost in that classical sense, that almost eventually the informal sector is going to kind of wither away. Um, but the evidence is, is against us. This is a point made by um, Marty Chen and the WeGo group. Uh, Marty has a paper coming out with WIDA uh, by the end of the year on informal employment. And one big point that she makes is that Economists have got to start thinking a little bit differently about informal employment. Informal employment is not something that's going to wither away. Actually, it's probably going to become bigger and bigger in our lifetimes. And this actually goes to the, the point about gender raised by the person from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of, of Finland. Because, of course, a lot of women work in the informal sector. It's a, it's a very female sector, not exclusively so. And so that if you're looking for, for ways to improve the empowerment of women in employment, uh, raise their productivity and ultimately their earnings, you're looking at the informal sector to a degree. Um, but that also includes, includes large investments in the care economy because women are disproportionately um, in the care economy looking after family members and sickness and health, whether they hold an informal job or a formal job. 
Um, to degree, you can start to invest some of the resource rents that you get from things like extractive industries in improving support to women in the care economy. Uh, some mechanisms of social protection provide additional income to the households to allow women to cope with those, those time burdens. But the, the challenge of generating female employment is, is, a, is a very, very large one. Now, I don't in any of that want to suggest that the, um, the discussion around formal employment uh, is uh, going off track, but is, is not. But as we've seen from both Carol um, and Andy and, and Sam, um, uh, we don't want to be pessimistic, but we have to be re very realistic. Uh, particularly as we might be starting to have some headwinds, uh, including the reshoring, potentially, of jobs um, back to the developed world. And that's certainly something that politics in the richer world uh, is in favor of, reshoring jobs back to the United States and, and, and so forth. Um, Ricardo's point about just sort of re in the interconnections between uh, the jobs crisis and some of the other crises that we're raising in the, in the conference, um, one thing we haven't actually discussed in this session is climate change. <laughs> and WIDER has actually done a lot of work on climate change, including for Mozambique. And of course, uh, climate change is going to impact particularly the availability of livelihoods in the agricultural sector, um, the potential interest of foreign investors for good or bad in the agricultural sector, something that um, you know, we have been looking for at, in, in, in terms of, of Mozambique, but also Vietnam uh, and other economies. Um, so the forces driving migration, uh, in, uh, environmental refugees um, are much more than simply jobs per se. Um, they will be environmental stress and, and climate change. Those, of course, those forces, very forces can destroy jobs uh, as well. And that leads to me to the thought about, you know, one question we need to think about, perhaps in this session a little bit more, is um, the jobs, jobs and livelihoods for the vast number of displaced people we have now, <laughs> internally displaced people um, within the conflict countries, Syria, Iraq, um, Libya, uh, refugees. Um, you know, the, we, we used to think of the, their job crises as not peripheral, but in some ways, you know, small numbers. Um, but they're very, very large numbers now, as we can see. Um, they actually have a lot of capital, some of them. There's quite a lot, a lot of what we might call diaspora capital, access to funds. Um, you know, how might that be deployed for reinvestment back in these economies as they reconstruct, as they stabilize from, from war to peace? Uh, Gilles Carbonier is in the audience, might want to come in on these points because Gilles works on, on humanitarian um, economics. Um, so I think I, those are my just kind of additional thoughts on these, uh, on these issues. Uh, one final one is, again, this was set off by thinking about Sam's paper. And this, again, is how we've changed in development economics that, you know, we used to think of, of developing countries as very capital constrained. And you think back to the classical, you know, uh, two gap, three gap model. You know, the problem is getting capital. But what Sam showed was actually Mozambique can get a lot of capital, a lot of foreign investment. It has a current macro problem, but that's not associated this longer-term investment prospect. Uh, so, you know, one thing that's improved is we seem to have improved the capital flow problem, not for all countries, not for all sectors, but it's better than it was 30 years ago, partly through the, uh, the um, actions of FinFund and the other DFIs, but also through private investors. Uh, but we still have this jobs crisis. So... It seems to me that as development economists, we've got to rethink some of our basic premises, or at least question them. You know, are these capital scarce economies anymore? Anyway, those are my thoughts. Next three, we start from the back. Um, thank you. Um, my name is Rob Foss from the FAO. Um, I liked very much the presentation, but I most liked the last two interventions because I think those are the issues we should be talking about. A lot of the presentations sounded very traditional and old-fashioned to talk about structural change, moving from low productivity to higher productivity sectors, without looking 
more precisely what's happening within those sectors and between those sectors and what dynamics are really going on. So first, first question is, is for instance, and um, since I work for the Food and Agriculture Organization, I think I should say that, is agriculture really, really a low productivity sector? If you, um, there's some recent studies done for, for Africa, if you calculate um, agricultural outputs per hour worked and not per worker, then a lot of the differences with the non-agriculture sectors uh, disappear. What's the point there? You could say, well, what does it matter to a farmer if, if his income is still low, uh, whether it's then by that definition called a higher sector, but what it means, there's a lot of under an underemployment which could be used. And some, a lot of farmers use the off season to find employee in other sectors already to diversify. What it also means is a lot of uh, potential to develop, um, to, to raise productivity, uh, create more production, if there's better use of that um, uh, surplus labor in the sector. And what we see, and that's the dynamics coming from food industries and from dietary change, change in dietary patterns, um, that there's a lot more scope to do so. That's the, with urbanization, income growth, also in Africa, we see more demand for fruits, vegetables, meats, and so on, which can be used in the off-season or can be produced in the off-season from the staple crops and so on. Now, and we see that happening and that that's changing quite a bit of the dynamics, but it, what it means, we need to look at the dynamics between the sectors and what facilitates that that dynamics takes place. So that requires investing in rural urban linkages, in cold storage, in cold transportation, uh, and better distribution systems to make that happen. And out of that, you can create a lot of jobs. So um, we see a lot of that dynamics. It's very uneven, and that's what you should look at. On rural urban linkages, what we find is that um, those can be very strong dynamizers of both of poverty reduction, stimulate agricultural productivity growth, particularly if it's through non-farm activities, not necessarily rural, but in smaller, small townships, small rural townships, small cities, rather than when it happens in the big cities. And the several parts of Africa, we've seen that dynamics are growing. So again, those linkages and strengthening looking at that would be important. Um, the final point is, um, where I think uh, where Andy started out, which we didn't see at the back at, at the end, is this demographic bulge, right? There's one constraint, and that's where the real jobs crisis is bound to be concentrated, is in this huge bulge. Because even if we manage to do this, right, in have agriculture being become a much large, larger employer or sort of help absorb this growing uh, labor force, um, where we know non-agriculture sex can't do it. We also find in our practical work is that a lot of youths don't want to work in agriculture or stay in rural areas. So what needs to be done to change that around? And uh, I think that's where we'll find, uh, at least over the coming couple of decades, uh, where we find huge problems and a real crisis, which will spill over to other crises, migration, conflict, what have you. Uh, <clears throat> Gilles Garbonnier, thank you very much. I, I just want to come back also uh, uh, to uh, what Sam said, where saying, well, we don't really know where the next big opportunity for uh, labor intensive activities might emerge. And uh, the remark of uh, the representative of FAO on, on demographics, I was really struck uh, last year by the uh, African Economic Outlook, uh, which went at length on demographics. And uh, just there is one indication with regard to how the workforce will evolve between 2010 and 2050. Sub-Saharan Africa, 830 million more. North Africa, 80 million addition, so it's over 910 million uh, increase in the workforce for Africa alone. China, minus 150 million. Europe, minus 100 million. So I think these are sea changes which really resonate very much with uh, Ricardo, but not uh, 
our Ricardo, David Ricardo, meaning a change in comparative advantages where Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa in particular has been for so long uh, land abundant, relatively land abundant and relatively uh, labor scarce, which was the contrary in Southeast Asia. So no wonder that uh, each uh, region specialized where they had uh, uh, a comparative advantage and this might change right now. And my question maybe to the panelists, I don't know who would like to take this up, is that do you see this happening? Carol, you have done some research in Ethiopia, for instance. I understand that Chinese investments have started to relocate, uh, even from Cambodia or places like that, into, for instance, uh, Ethiopia. But what I hear is really anecdotal. And my question is whether we see that actually this uh, relative abundance of labor is, uh, is materializing in uh, an opportunity for industrialization. Uh, also, maybe in, in Rwanda, because Rwanda, from what I understand, the government very much wants to emulate the Southeast Asian miracle uh, recipe, and it is a, a labor abundant country. So, uh, do we see this starting to happen? Because if it doesn't happen, it means that the Syrian refugee crisis, as we see it today, in Europe is a courtesy visit compared to what looms ahead of us. And maybe just a final question to Andy. Uh, with regard to aid, uh, if I understand you correctly, we should all switch to South-South cooperation, India, uh, Chinese style, meaning focusing much more on infrastructure and investing uh, on, uh, well, this is a, a question, whether, whereas actually, uh, South-South cooperation as exercised by China in Africa is kind of the type of changes that you think might really impact on the capacity for uh, industrialization and, uh, and uh, greater investment in uh, labor-intensive activities. I, I can clarify what I uh, Final question and now very short. Oh, thank you. I'm Susan Kavma from Uganda. Uh, the first one is a clarification from Andy, the difference between industry and manufacturing. I saw it appearing in the presentation you gave. Then uh, to Caro, you mentioned that we should focus on the large farms and, and I was wondering that besides FDIs, it is government, but we know that most of the governments in developing countries are resource constrained, especially, you know, most of them are running budget deficits. And then if you look at the employees in uh, public farms up on permanent basis and uh, given the the baby boom a youth has to wait for 40 to 50 years before this person retires at 70 or 60 so i wonder how we can go about uh, promoting these large farms as opposed to the small farms that are producing uh, indecent jobs then the other question is to do with the lack of capabilities that you mentioned carol in your presentation what is the problem? Is it a skills uh, gap uh, that they don't have the skills, the human resource doesn't have the skills for the management, or it is an experience problem? And as Sam was presenting, I, I thought about the issue of job creation and productivity. And I thought that perhaps for developing country, the focus should be more on job creation, given the high population growth rates we have. Because I asked myself, what is the incentive to invest in productivity technologies I, that, that will increase labor productivity when I can get an extra person cheaply. So I think we need to think about that, so the incentive to really uh, boost productivity amidst this high supply of labor. And lastly, the jobless growth. What, is, what could be causing this jobless growth? Uh, I think, Sam, you mentioned that, uh, you know, most of the, the productivity is high in, is in, mining, in, the, in the mining sector. And perhaps we need to think about how we are allocating resources in the different sectors. Could it be that there is a misallocation of resources, even on the macro level, that we end up having the jobless growth? Because we know that in most of these developing countries, it is agriculture where people are, majority are, but for some reason, they don't get the, the share that is seen in other countries. Thank you. Hi, thanks. Um, <clears throat> so there's, there's an, I think there's an interesting question in terms of uh, um, aid 
uh, ODA or, and what the international community might do about any of these things. I mean, it's, I mean some of my recent work has shown how um, uh, most middle-income countries could reallocate uh, change in, changes in fiscal policy would be more than enough to bring three quarters of the world up to five dollars a day. And, you know, after the first or second year of that of transfers, of course, you you know presumably it would create a multiplier effect of some kind, uh, and then there'd be huge sums of money potentially for for infrastructure and economic development. So, I mean, one thing actually building what Tony said, I think in addition to the capital question, the 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 the, the good news in a way is that I think there's there's a many countries. A, but not obviously not the poorest in the world have substantial resources now in in terms of money that could be spent. Um, I mean the, the I mean some of the recent work we were doing as well the the the, the spending on uh, regressive fossil fuel subsidies is over a trillion dollars a year in the developing world and that you know that could be redirected for one one piece of work we were doing. I think that this so I mean at the moment you know the the annual ODA budget is whatever 100, 138 billion a year, of which uh, I think it is. 25% uh, is combined to um, uh, economic infrastructure and production, as, as is categorised by the, the DAC. Um, so that actually now that, that sort of gives you whatever 35 billion. So there's a potentially 100 billion there that that most of which is going into social spending. So there's a question mark, and I'm not I'm not sure what I what my actual op opinion is on this. It's it's a it's it's, it's a thought. Um, the, is there a situation where Many developing countries are now in a situation to fund social policy, but it's quite difficult to fund long-run infrastructure uh, when when the benefits uh, are, are over 20, 25 years' time. It's difficult for a politician to be spending a lot of money. Um, I mean, yeah, you could. I mean, it, it's the sort of uh, um, a kind of shift from it was really shift the kind of aid as poverty reduction, or has become aid and social development to effectively, I don't know, aid as concrete. Um, and, um, and 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 that you know, in, you can see in a way the, the the Asian Infrastructure Bank is obviously thinking ahead on some of these issues. There's an enormous need for for infrastructure in in, in developing countries, and it's uh, the, the the upfront costs are very high, and the benefits take a lot of time to come. It seems to me that's an interesting area for, for aid to think about a bit more. Um, and obviously, you could not only with a B. Uh, short-run stimulus in terms of enormous amount of job creation, um, you'd obviously be pushing the production possibility frontier and increasing long-run economic development. Uh, um, on, on some of the other issues, uh, but as I say, I'm not, I'm not sure how I feel about this, uh, but I, I think it's, there's, a de there's a debate to be had there, I think. Um, I mean, on, on some of the other issues, I think... Um, well, you know, in an ideal world, the countries that were labour abundant, those people could migrate to the countries with labour shortages, uh, and that, that that would be the, the what Arthur Lewis originally intended. In although there was only a, a smaller account of the opened economy in the original uh, model, original uh, exposition of the model, um, you know, Europe is going to be a hundred million people less. Then you know, maybe migration to Europe isn't so bad. Um, but then the, these, these are very difficult political arguments to make, I think, uh, 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 at the, at the, particularly this moment in time. Um, and I think the final thing would just be uh, to respond, uh, Rob, on, on thinking about agriculture. The, the point you made about different ways of measuring productivity, I think that's really interesting. I hadn't, I, that's, I hadn't thought about that before. Um, I guess it, 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 it comes back to the kind of response of which countries have ever got rich on agriculture? I mean, that's the kind of, if you can come back to a response on that, I mean, but maybe it's not about getting rich, it's about providing reasonable jobs. And, but who's going to provide those, who's going to provide those jobs? Uh, I think it's still an underlying question. Uh, is it SMEs? Is it state-owned enterprises? Is it foreign direct investment? Who's, who's, who's the employer? Um, I, and, and, and just a quick afterthought, I don't know where things are with land reform in terms of the debates around land reform and agriculture at the moment. Um, I'm just aware that land reform was an absolute prerequisite in East Asia for building a, you know, a capital owning class and a national bourgeoisie. Um, and so I don't know when, where debates around land reform are in Africa at the moment, but I'd be curious to, to have that kind of, hear more about that side of things. Um, 
thank you for the questions. I don't have too much extra to add on top of what Andy has said. I do agree with a lot of what he said, particularly in terms of like the short-term benefits from infrastructural investment and the jobs that can be created from that. I think that's an important point. Um, going to the question about the, the relocation, I'm not sure what the evidence is actually on that specifically. Like, like you, most of the evidence I have is anecdotal. Um, that there there is somewhat of relocation of firms um, from from Southeast Asia to to African countries, but I'm not sure if it's materialised to the extent that it could. But we certainly identify it as an opportunity, um, in our work, um, as something that where where jobs could be created in the future. Um, the question relating to um, the focus on foreign firms and the focus on large firms, um, I think that there can also be a focus on on the productive small to medium-sized enterprises and allowing them to, or facilitating them graduating into becoming larger firms. But in some ways that involves, you know, picking picking winners at the end of the day. Um, and there's something to be said for formal sector employment and promoting formal sector employment, because it's from that basis you can build a, a tax system, which will inject resources into the public sector that can then be, then can be used for whatever social spending or for infrastructure investment or whatever the case may be. Um, in terms of the capabilities, I think it's a combination of a number of capabilities. A number of studies that have shown that the management um, that, that in, in, in many developing countries, um, the capabilities in terms of managing larger firms and managing firms above a certain size threshold are difficult. And there have been some interesting experimental work that's looked at providing management training um, to small to medium sized enterprises and has seen very significant effects on productivity as a result of that. So it's an emerging area that, that, um, that is being looked at. But there are also other things like skills mismatches and investing in skills, also experience, also learning and all of these things. Um, so the, the capabilities stems across a range of different, of different areas. But it also relates to a lack of, kind of underlying complexity in terms of, of, um, of the types of sectors um, that are productive uh, or that types of sectors that, that are in operation domestically. If you don't have the sectors there to begin with, you don't have that, that experience and that learning, and then you can't feed into the supply chain as a result of it. Um, so I think that's all I'd say. Yeah, just, uh, I, guess, uh, I guess, two or three comments. So uh, first, apologies to the first uh, uh, comment if they found the, uh, the talk a little bit traditional and boring. Um, however, um, what, what I would say in response, though, is that I think uh, some of the issues that you were raising about the importance of value chains and intersectoral linkages, I, I don't think anyone would deny, not, not at all. But if you look at the kinds of studies that are done in Mozambique on those, on those points, they do come back to fundamental issues. Fundamental issues, for example, why aren't value chains getting going? Lack of infrastructure, lack of access to capital, uh, problems with electricity. So a range of these fundamental issues come back time and time again. And, uh, and I think that's important. And that comes back uh, also to the issue about what is the magnitude of the challenge that we're facing. Also, with respect to intersectoral linkages, um, I mean, a lot of the work we have done has actually looked at that in some more detail. So there is some academic work I can point you to uh, comparing, for example, Mozambique and Vietnam in terms of the, the quality and the nature of the multipliers linking different sectors. So I'd be happy to, to show you that. Um, with respect to job creation versus job productivity. I think it's an interesting, very interesting point. Um, in a sense, my answer would be both, please. Uh, of course, we want the job creation in terms of the new firms and uh, formal sector firms creating lots of new jobs. But we have to remember that the, those that can't find jobs there are going to go somewhere. And they're typically not going to just be unemployed. They will be working. And so raising the productivity of these other workers it is also fundamentally critical. Uh, whether we like it or not, they're very likely to go into agriculture. So raising the productivity of workers in agriculture remains a crucial task. Um, and that was why I was, uh, I was mentioning that point. Um, finally, why have we got this jobless growth? Um, well, I think if I'd love to be able to give you the answer, um, I guess. I think there's lots of different theories. Uh, one of the theories that comes out of uh, you know, a long tradition of, of sociology and political science uh, is this kind of extroversion of African elites. I think that's quite an interesting one. Um, but m maybe more simply and more practically, what's easier? Is it easier to uh, negotiate with uh, a large investor, a foreign investor, or get agriculture going? And I think part of this comes back to a state effectiveness problem. It's very difficult for, for some of the low-income countries to manage and effectively intervene uh, in complex uh, 
um, area such as agriculture, it's much easier to write a law and say, okay, here you go, Anadarko, you don't pay tax. Uh, and that is uh, potentially, I'm not saying it's the only reason, but I think it's part a reason of, about state effectiveness. Um, and that is an issue that, that's ongoing. Thank you. And then I'll, I'll give you some final thoughts. Um, uh, starting with job, jobless growth, um, to my mind, one of the biggest problems is that there just is not enough deployment of expansionary fiscal policy in the richer world. A lot of the debates in the richer world um, would be quite easily resolved um, if the richer world would just accept that it could actually run a more expansionary fiscal policy because um, the cost of borrowing is now extraordinarily low because of monetary policy. Monetary policy has basically run out of traction. Um, this is the zero interest rate debate and so on. Um, we need a fiscal expansion. It needs to be coordinated across the richer world. Insofar as it's coordinated across the richer world, it will generate more jobs in the richer world, but will also have secondary multiplier effects on the developing world. But it will also allow the richer world to stop these endlessly stupid debates about we cannot afford to invest more in the developing world, we cannot afford more humanitarian aid, we cannot afford to invest more in development banks, uh, in multinational, multilateral banks. Um, the fiscal constraint is, is, is not there. What is there is a sort of ultra-conservative fiscal conservatism, uh, which John Maynard Keynes would be spinning in his grave about. Okay? So that's a rather old-fashioned Keynesian view, mm -hmm. and I think you know, that is my answer to jobless growth. My final point is, um, this comes off uh, Gilles's point about demographic change, um, the, the, the youth bulge in, uh, in Africa, the d declining workforce in China. Um, in some ways, what we've got to break away from is the idea that globally there is a, what economists call a lump of labor fallacy. You know, the lump of labor fallacy is that my job takes your job away. What we've seen over a thousand years is enormous population growth and more jobs created. Um, Politicians in the richer world cynically operate with a lump of labor fallacy. They say, what is an American job should not be a Chinese job, should not be a Mozambican job. We know from development economics that if we get growth in Vietnam going at 8% or whatever it is, uh, we generate not a lot, a lot more jobs for Vietnamese, obviously, but a lot more jobs for foreign investors trading with Vietnam, for global value chains that connect Finnish companies and British companies and whatever with Vietnamese companies, you know, we get some, some winning games. So we have to change the narrative around jobs from this, if I have a job, you don't have a job, to if I have a job, two of you might have a job because I'll have more income, I'll need more services, there'll be more growth, more employment. Yeah, that's what we have to change. So that's my final thought. There would be many more questions, but we have used up our time. There is no way I can uh, summarize this, this, this uh, discussion in the end, but, but let me finish with, uh, with, uh, with uh, one point. Uh, in agriculture, there has been lots of thinking over the decades on how you can use basically the modern sector or, 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 or government or, 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 or large companies to improve the productivity of the smallholders. There, you have your extension, you have your agricultural research, you have your input supply, you have your seed industry, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what we uh, now have, given that, that, that uh, there is this large informal sector, uh, is a question that, that what, would be, what would be the sort of equivalent of research and extension and, uh, and input supply for all those informal sectors uh, what can, how can sort of the, 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 the formal sector uh, sort of link to, to all those people who can't find those jobs in the, in the, in the formal sector? Uh, one famous example is the, is the, uh, is the cell phone and, and, and the uh, uh, mobile payment systems. One part of what has been really inefficient in the informal sector is how you pay and how you get paid. Uh, the payment systems and and uh, we have uh, m pesas and, uh, and and others now now going on there are many other things how you learn things how you how you train yourself and 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 uh, uh, all sort of educational side and, and and many other areas where where somehow linking the larger companies uh, 
uh, or, or the formal sector to the, to the informal sector or the semi-formal sector, uh, there seems to be uh, lots of potential. And, and for instance, in, at, at FinFund, we have seen a number of, of interesting projects that, that are exactly in that space, trying to, 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 to bring those two things together. So there is an interesting area. Thanks. Thanks, Jonah.